Okay. Well, good morning, guys. Uh, it's so good to be here again. Um, but, you know, before I begin, uh, I just have to take a moment to thank all of you for the opportunity and the honor that it has been to serve here uh, for these five and a half years. It was October 2012 that I um, first came here. Uh, Pastor Mike invited me to come to be a part-time assistant for the youth ministry. And over the years, as Luke mentioned, my, my role here gradually, uh, increasingly grew and grew. And so uh, yesterday, as I was thinking about this, I wanted to go back and just kind of get a sense of the trajectory. So in 2014, I preached one sermon here in the, in the sanctuary. In 2015, I preached two sermons in here. In 2016, I preached four sermons, so we're, we're doubling each year. Uh, and then last year, 2017, uh, I preached 21 times uh, last year. So uh, it's, thank you, thank you. So I have to thank all of you for these opportunities uh, to, to speak. And over these years, it's been a blessing to work alongside you. And I've grown a lot as a teacher, as a preacher, and through your ministry to me and your example, I have grown uh, as a more uh, committed follower of Jesus. So thank all of you so much. Um, now, despite all of the time that I spend up front, it comes as a, a surprise maybe to some that I really don't enjoy public speaking. <laughs> uh, I don't enjoy being the center of attention. I don't enjoy being in the spotlight. Uh, so I, I actually, I really dislike those things. Uh, but I love preaching. And I think preaching to me is something else entirely. Because I, I enjoy preaching because I know that you didn't come to see me. Uh, I enjoy preaching because I know you didn't come to hear my words or to learn more about me. The best preacher, in my opinion, is one who kind of disappears behind the text. Uh, and that's what I, that's what I try to do. Uh, I try to become as transparent a window as possible uh, through which you can see the Lord because I know you didn't come to see me, but you came to see him. And you didn't come to hear what I had to say, uh, but you came to hear the word of God. So this morning, uh, this sermon will be self-indulgent, uh, but by that I mean it's not going to have anything to do with me. <laughs> uh, this is the kind of sermon that I would want to preach. Uh, some of you like it, some of you don't. It'll be a little more like uh, a lecture, not a lot of stories, not a lot of jokes, not a lot of illustrations, but I think uh, that this morning's message is the summary of what I believe the gospel to be. So I, I wanted to share that with you this morning. It's not my farewell message, uh, but as we read from the gospel of Matthew, uh, this is Christ's farewell message to the disciples. And he begins by saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And it's important that we realize that Jesus is able to make this claim that all authority belongs to him he makes this claim after his resurrection from the dead and not before. If you recall at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, the devil comes to him and tempts him and says, all the kingdoms of the world will be yours if you bow down and worship me. But Jesus refuses, you see, because Jesus had different plans. Jesus is not going to gain all authority in heaven and on earth by submitting to the devil but by conquering him and reclaiming what the devil had stolen. And the resurrection of Jesus is that victory. Paul describes it this way to the Ephesians. He says, The Father raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. The resurrection of Jesus is the exaltation to the right hand of the Father. And why is he exalted to the highest place? Why is Jesus given the name above every name? Because on the cross, Jesus took the lowest place. Again, as Paul explains to the Philippians, 
He says, Christ took the form of a slave. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, because of this, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee should bow at the name of Jesus in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Now, what does that mean uh, that those who are under the earth what does that mean but that Jesus has dominion not only over heaven and earth, but over the realm of the dead as well. As Christ will say in the book of Revelation, I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead and see I am alive forever and ever. I have the keys of death and of Hades. Jesus has the keys of Hades. Jesus has the keys of death, meaning the gates of the underworld cannot contain him. See, those keys are the power over death that he wins in the resurrection. He wins a victory over all the powers of the world, even over death itself. Again, as Paul will say to the Romans, for this reason, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. So when the risen Jesus comes to the disciples and says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he is claiming victory. Victory over the world. Victory over the kingdoms of the world. Victory over sin. Victory over the devil. Even victory over death itself. And in light of that victory, he says to the disciples, go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In essence, Christ is saying, because I am risen from the dead, go and baptize. And what's the relationship between Jesus' resurrection and our baptism? Paul makes it very plain in Romans chapter 6. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. You see, in Christ's death and resurrection, he unlocks the gates of death and makes a way to eternal life. So if we want to share in Christ's glory, that is, if we want to live and reign with Jesus for all eternity, then we must also die with him. In order to be united to him in his resurrection, we must be united to him in his death. And we do this through baptism. In baptism, we die with Christ. And if we have died with Christ, then we will also be raised with Christ, the Bible says. Why then are we baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? Because this Trinitarian formula encapsulates the meaning of our baptism. To say God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a summary of the entire gospel. Think back again to the gospel of Matthew when Jesus is baptized. And the gospel says, when he had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. You see, at the baptism of Jesus, 
the Holy Spirit descends on him and he is proclaimed to be the Son of God. And this is for our sake. Make no mistake that it's not as if prior to this Jesus had not received the Holy Spirit. It's not as if prior to this Jesus was not already the Son of God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live and reign for one God as one God for all eternity. But at the baptism of Jesus, we see this scene unfold for our sake. Because when we are baptized, we receive that same Holy Spirit. And so when we are baptized, we are declared children of God. Because we are baptized into that body, that body of Christ. And so sharing in his person, we are adopted as children of God. Again, the Bible says, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. You see, Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of God. We know that language from Scripture, right? Jesus is God's only Son, we say. Jesus is the only Son of God by birth. Jesus is the only Son of God by nature. But we, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we become adopted as God's children. So then we are baptized in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because when we receive the Holy Spirit, we are united to Christ, the Son, so that we too may call God our Father. And now, here is where it gets practical. Because Christ says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Having been baptized, we're now called to obedience. Because having been baptized into Christ's death, our lives must now take on this cruciform shape. We must live our lives in conformity to Christ's passion. His sufferings must become our sufferings. What pains him must pain us. The life of baptism is what Paul describes to the Galatians when he says, I've been crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In baptism, we are made dead to sin because the old self has passed away. The old you was buried in the waters of baptism, never again to return. And now, having been put to death in the flesh, we are made alive in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit floods into our souls, adopting us as children of God. So now we live a new life, not one of sin, but of righteousness. Not of selfishness, but of selfless love. So by virtue of your new identity, your new life in Christ, you are called to a new way of living. A life of perfect obedience. A life of holiness. In which we obey everything Christ has commanded us. And that may, that may strike us as quite daunting. To obey everything that Christ has commanded us. But make no mistake about it. Jesus says the life of holiness is not easy. The gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are few who find it. But we must remember that God not only calls us to holiness, but he equips us with holiness. To obey everything that Christ commanded may seem overwhelming, but keep in mind that the commandments of Christ are just this one thing. He says that you love one another as I have loved you. And there's the key. Our love for one another, which is our duty and our salvation, is itself an effect of having received 
the love of Christ. If we are to learn how to love, we must learn to be loved. We love because he first loved us. For while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. As Paul says in Romans 5.5, 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. You see, that Holy Spirit that we receive is the love of God poured into our hearts. And so by receiving that Spirit, by abiding in that Spirit, and every day walking in that Spirit, we will fulfill every commandment. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, patience and kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. It is the promise of the abiding presence and power of the Holy Spirit with which Christ left the apostles. And that's why he's able to say to them, Remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Because through the presence and power of the Spirit, Christ is always with his church. And so I can think of no better message to leave you with than this. To remain open to the Spirit through scripture and prayer and song and fellowship. Never silence the voice of conscience in your heart. Follow the Spirit wherever he leads. But know that it is the role of the Holy Spirit to make you more like Jesus. So expect the Spirit to lead you in places that you don't want to go. Expect the Holy Spirit to lead you to your own cross. But there, at the cross, united with Christ in his death, you will also experience the greatest love, the greatest joy, and the greatest peace. Because it is in receiving the Holy Spirit, it is in being conformed to the image of the Son, that we come to know God as our Father. And so we praise the eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who was and is and is to come. Amen.